The focus of my research are patients with decompensated cirrhosis who have received interferon-free antiviral therapy. So the study population are patients who were first provided um, interferon-free hepatitis C treatments in England. Um, and this was through a special access program called the Expanded Access Program. So I've studied um, a portion of these patients and uh, looked at their virological outcomes and uh, assessed also their uh, early uh, liver function change following clearance of the virus. The patients who had enrolled in this uh, treatment program had uh, consented for us to follow them up prospectively. So we have collected data um, in terms of their virology as well as their liver function and uh, any clinical adverse events um, all the way along the treatment as, as well as the follow-up period. Um, but uh, more importantly, we tried to address the question of what the impact of clearing viruses for this patient um, population that have very severe liver disease and try to answer whether or not Perhaps there's a, a point of no return that they don't gain any benefit anymore because they've already got decompensated cirrhosis. So in order to do that, we actually retrospectively studied um, a population of patients who had equal stage of liver disease but did not receive antiviral therapy. And these patients did not receive treatment because we've selected those who were uh, registered that we have data for for at least six months prior to this treatment program had begun. So at the time, there were no drugs available because of course you can imagine it's not ethical and it wouldn't be possible to perform a randomised um, study to just withhold treatment on some patients. The short answer is that we felt uh, there's evidence showing that treated patients did much better both in terms of their MEL score changes as well as in terms of the number of adverse events decompensations. Um, we obviously are aware that you know, this isn't a controlled study, so we were uh, we, uh, very careful to try and um, select an appropriate uh, comparator group. We've looked at things such as, uh, you know, there were differences in terms of the proportion of patients who were active alcohol users, which of course might affect their outcomes. Uh, we've uh, sort of looked at patients who uh, were all um, non-alcohol users, and it turns out that you know, they, they, they were very comparable, so it suggests to us that any differences and any improvements in the treated patients were indeed down to antiviral therapy, which is, which is great, which is what we hope to see. What was surprising was when we tried to look at uh, predictors of whether patients uh, were likely to clear their virus or not, um, of course, it's now very uh, clear through lots of studies that genotype, particularly genotype 3, is difficult to treat and we equally found that, in fact, in the UK we have a very high proportion of genotype 3 patients. Uh, but one thing that we found very interesting was that among genotype 3 patients, patients who were slow to clear the virus and who were still viremic at week 2 on treatment seem to be more difficult to cure. Um, compared to patients who cleared the virus very quickly and were negative by week two, they were about 10% uh, more likely to re relapse, which we think is a very novel and interesting finding. And um, you know, we're interested to, to, to take that further and see whether there may be implications perhaps for uh, stratifying treatment regimes uh, for different patients according to their viral kinetics. That's something that I think is very novel. You know, I think what's really exciting and the reason why so many people um, who are outside of the field have been interested and aware is because this is one of the few chronic illnesses that we have been able to say we can cure. But of course with decompensated, decompensated cirrhosis, it's not just clearing the virus, it's how much improvement or recovery of liver function there may be. So we've tried out, you know, by, by analysing what happens um, in the early phase post-treatment, but also subsequently we are looking at the longer term outcome. We try to address this very important question um, of you know, how much improvement there may or may not be uh, for these patients who are indeed very sick already. When we started treating out these patients, uh, 
the obvious question they would ask is, what's, going to, what's my likely chance of cure and what happens after cure? And actually, these were questions that at the beginning we weren't very adequately able to answer because the data was very new. And of course, there are other um, European and American studies looking at decompensated cirrhosis as well. But you know, when we first started out treatment in April 2014, there were a lot of questions, but uh, you know, we, we gave treatment with the best intentions and we were very pleased to see that it does seem as though uh, we, we've, we've uh, get done justice with these patients who've cleared the virus and have had improvements in, in the majority. There are excellent drugs out there, but we can only treat who we know have the infection. So, you know, please go on and screen your patients, please go on to uh, offer treatments to the patients. Um, and one day, perhaps hepatitis C will no longer be an infection that uh, affects the world. I think there's certainly challenges. So in well-resourced countries, the uh, problem is finding patients to come forward and to receive treatment. Um, because interferon-free therapies are uh, so successful and so much well, so much better tolerated, we have seen lots of patients who previously had no interest in treatment coming forward. But as I said, you know, patients who don't know that they have an infection will never come forward for treatment. So that's a problem within the well-resourced world, even if access to treatment isn't a problem. But you know, for example, in the UK, we are still uh, restricted by. Um, our, our, our budgets, you know, all treatments are free at the point of care, so um, there are obviously very expensive therapies. Um, in other countries and in other settings, um, you know, obviously they have different uh, provisions for treatment. So I think to say that hepatitis C will be no longer in the near future, or even in many years down the line, is, is still a very ambitious um, aim, but it's nonetheless something that we should aim to achieve. The next step in re this research is uh, to try and identify um, as, uh, as clearly as we can which patients are likely to benefit or not, because I think the bottom line is that not every patient who has such sick liver disease will equally benefit, um, but also patients who uh, we've, we've seen across different studies that patients with uh, advanced liver disease are more difficult to clear their virus, so what happens when they haven't cured? Uh, you know, is there a problem with resistance? What is it that makes them difficult to cure? Is it the fact that they have got decompensated cirrhosis? Is it to do with their immune response? Is it that the drugs don't work as well for them? There are lots of questions that are still unanswered. The truth is that across um, you know, different, different countries, a lot of patients with advanced liver disease have already gone through treatment. So the hope is that we are treating less and less sick patients now. Um, and obviously for patients with mild disease, once you've cleared the virus, that's, that's the end of the story. And you know, they will uh, go on to do very well, which is why this field is such an exciting field.